as uh, Dave mentioned, thank you for the intro, Dave. Appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for the applause, guys. Appreciate that as well. Very kind. But hey, uh, my name is Michael. It's a privilege to be able to bring God's Word to you uh, this morning. And uh, I'm excited to be here today preaching through uh, what is an epic Uh, sort of chunk of scripture. And we're actually covering quite a big chunk today. So we're going from uh, the second half of uh, chapter 11 of 1 Kings all the way to um, that second half of chapter 14. So I would love to encourage you to get your Bible out and uh, follow with me this morning. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, pull out your app or bible.com. But if you don't own a Bible, uh, while you validate your parking, why don't you see the guys at the info desk and we would love to gift you uh, with a Bible. Um, So a little bit about me. I'm married to Izzy. Uh, We have four kids. We've got Ollie, Jonas, Noah, and Georgia. I think that's it. Um, I've got to get right. I think they'll be watching online at the moment. Uh, And uh, Izzy and I have been married for nearly 14 years this January. Um, And for about 12 of those years, uh, Izzy has been pleading, asking, nagging, encouraging me uh, to go and get a sleep study test. Uh, you know, she says, listen, I can live with the snoring, uh, but I freak out watching you not breathing in the night, and so I want you to go get a sleep study test. Uh, you know, she claims that I'm tired and irritable. Um, I'll put that down to the fact that we've been in, like, the newborn ba- phase for, like, nine years. Um, sure, maybe I fall asleep sometimes watching the footy on the couch. Who doesn't? Uh, maybe I fall asleep when we have friends over uh, for dinner uh, while they're chatting. I just put that down to the fact that we need more interesting friends, right? Um, (laughs) Apologies, because I've fallen asleep with some of you at our house. Uh, But anyway, uh, after, you know, over a decade of her um, encouraging me to go get this sleep study, I concede. And so, finally go in to uh, see the sleep physician. On my way there, I'm on the phone to Izzy, and I said, listen, like... At worst, I might get like a mild sleep apnea diagnosis, but you know, darling, trust me, I'm a dentist, you know, I know a thing or two about sleep apnea, definitely nothing serious. So anyway, get in there, Uh, the physician asks, you know, why are you here? I said, don't worry, no problems here, Uh, I'm just here so my wife will stop nagging me uh, to get the sleep study test. He's like, all right, fine, fair enough. So you know, you get hooked up, had a great sleep, no kids came into the bed, it was, um, it was wonderful. And so the next morning, go in, you see the physician, um, he throws the report over the desk and he starts circling where I stopped breathing. And I'm starting to go, oh gosh, there's a lot of circles here. And uh, he explains to me that I fell within 0.5% of being diagnosed as severe sleep apnea. And, um, you know, naturally, I'm like, oh, no. And he's like, I know, you know, this is serious. It's, it's you know, going to mean some life change. It's really important. You're gonna... I'm like, no, 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 none of that. Izzy's going to say, I told you so. <laughs> and uh, and he uh, just looks at me very seriously, you know, a professional, giving me advice. He said, Michael, you're just going to have to cop it. You're going to have to let her have a moment. And if you don't push back, it won't last as long. But um, <laughs> have you ever had that? moment in your life where you realize that uh, there's been good advice uh, that you've just ignored. You know, someone's been telling you something that is good for you and you just won't have it. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, that was just one of many (laughs) questions, uh, sort of uh, examples I could have used in our marriage where I haven't listened to my wife's uh, wise advice and hopefully in the next 14 years I'll do better at that. Uh, But this morning as we reach uh, this passage, Uh, We reach a critical part in the history of the Old Testament. Uh, You know, Mike gave us that intro last week. We saw the life of Solomon that started off so good, the temple was built and times were good, and then things started to go downhill. Um, And we pick it up today uh, as Solomon is dying and the kingdom tragically splits. Uh, We've got two kingdoms. The golden era in Israel's history is about to end. Um, And, you know... Oftentimes, um, in my life, anyway, I've, I've been to a couple of you know, leadership seminars, you know, how to be a better leader, you buy books about leadership. Um, when you read First and Second Kings, it's like that, complete, but completely opposite, right? So this is the how not to lead people book. And, um, and so we can see a lot of mistakes that these people make, and often mistakes are an opportunity for us to learn. Uh, you know, in the New Testament, we're often reminded to look at Israel's folly and go back and see where they've stuffed up uh, for our good. And so uh, there's a lot going on in these chapters, and I really want to encourage you during the week to get in and dig in 
and um, see the story and see what happens because there's heaps in it for you. But for the sake of me limiting this sermon to not be a five-hour sermon, uh, we're going to actually focus mainly on Jeroboam and his failures. And um, his failures actually have a theme throughout the other stories as well. Uh, But we're going to see three failures uh, from Jeroboam. Uh, The first one is the failure to hear God's word. Uh, The second one we're going to look at is his failure to walk in God's ways. And the third one is the failure to see God's work in history. So, Let's set the scene, and I'll see if I can run you through over this four-chapter period. So we have a diagram coming up. Um, Yesterday, this diagram looked like a uh, three-year-old put it together, but I sent it to the comms team, and look at this. It looks amazing. So thank you. Uh, But this will be a a bit of a helpful guide. So we heard last week that God told Solomon, listen, because of your sin, because of bringing in false gods, uh, bringing in the false gods of your foreign wives that you weren't even meant to marry, the kingdom is going to be taken away from your children. And so we first hear about Jeroboam, who is not Solomon's son, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 26. He starts off full of promise. He says he's super able. And as a result, Solomon actually notices him and makes him the ruler over forced labor in the house of Joseph. So Jeroboam, who is not Solomon's son, is out and about doing his thing, and he meets a prophet called Ahizah. And Ahizah tells him, listen, God is actually going to take 10 of the tribes away from the house of Solomon, and you're going to become king of Israel. Now, it's going to happen after Solomon dies, and God says to him, listen, if you follow my commands, if you don't worship false gods, if you walk in my ways the way David did, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to give you a long-lasting kingdom. And so um, Solomon may have gotten wind of this, or maybe Jeroboam couldn't help himself and he didn't wait until Solomon had died and tried to take the throne. But something went down and we're told that Solomon actually tries, uh, you know, wants to get Jeroboam killed. And so Jeroboam hightails it out of Israel and goes and hides in Egypt until Solomon dies. All right, does that make sense so far? Um, I'm going to take the silence as yes. This is good. This is good. Uh, so, um, then we pick up the part that we just read in the passage where Solomon dies and his son Rehoboam takes the throne of Israel. Okay? At this point, Jeroboam goes, sweet, it's safe to come back. So, he comes back. So, Jeroboam and the people of Israel go up to Rehoboam and say, listen, you need to ease our load here. And Rehoboam goes, great, I'll think about it. Come back in three days. He goes, he uh, talks to some older, wiser people, gets their advice, doesn't like what they have to say. So he goes to his mates, and he likes their advice more. So he runs with that, and we have disastrous outcome. Um, You know, the kingdom is split. Israel rebel against the house of David, and 10 of the tribes then go on to form Israel with Jeroboam as their king. And he he has to sort of escape back down to Jerusalem, uh, where he remains king of what's referred to as Judah. And so um, Jeroboam, hot off realizing that God's fulfilled his promise, you know, he was told he was going to become king of these 10 tribes. He realizes that, but he decides, hey, I don't want to risk these Israelites going back to Jerusalem to worship God in the temple, because what if they turn their hearts and their allegiance back to Rehoboam? And David's house. Like, after all, they've just turned on Rehoboam, so they've proven that they're a pretty fickle bunch, right? So you can understand that concern. So what does he do? He decides to build some golden calves for them to worship, and he made up his own religion that meant that they didn't have to leave Israel. Um, They didn't have to go into Jerusalem to worship God. And so in chapter 13, we meet a, a random man of God. That's, that's the only name we get. Uh, he's from Judah. He confronts Jeroboam at one of these altars. He pronounces judgment on him. And Jeroboam's like, no, nah, get, you know, get this guy. His hand freezes. Uh, he asks the man of God to heal it. He does. Read that little exchange <laughs> in your own time. There's a lot of really interesting side stories. But needless to say, despite this warning and seeing God's power, Um, chapter 13 finishes with Jeroboam still not turning away from his evil ways. And then in chapter 14, uh, the prophet Ahiza, so Ahiza was the first prophet that told Jeroboam that one day he would be king of Israel. He actually pronounces judgment against Jeroboam and his family and his descendants. Okay, So what starts off 
so positive for Jeroboam actually ends in disaster. Uh, like I said, it is action-packed, and, uh, and that was without me even mentioning uh, the line mauling in that story. So I, I encourage you to get in and spend some time reading that uh, throughout, throughout the week. Um, but what we see is, um, you know, as I read and reread this passage um, over the last couple of weeks, the thing that jumped out to me when you're looking at Jeroboam and Rehoboam is they both made really bad decisions, but neither was because they didn't know what the right thing to do was. Right? They knew what the right thing to do was, but they had a failure to hear God's word. It was the good advice that they just didn't take. Think about it. You know, Jeroboam, he gets a prophecy from Ahazah, like I said, um, that he's going to be king. Uh, it gets fulfilled. You know, in chapter 11, verse 38, it says... And if you listen to all that I command and will walk in my ways and do what's right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, I'll be with you and build you a sure house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. Yet, when he becomes king, he gets insecure about it. You know, he's thinking, geez, I'm not from the line of David. Like, what if I'm not legitimate here? And so he's desperate not to lose the kingdom. So whether it's insecurity, whether it's fear, whether it's pride, maybe it's a combination of all of them, he decides not to trust God's word to him. Um, he doesn't want to risk people turning back to Rehoboam, so he desperately wants to keep the power. So rather than listening to God's words, he decides to just rejig the religion a bit and make up his own gods. And, you know, when he seeks counsel, he doesn't go back to Ahiza, the guy that actually brought him God's word, he gets advice from some joker who suggests a golden calf. Does that sound familiar in Israel's history at all? You know, we look at the bottom of Mount Sinai, what happened with the golden calves as they worshipped that led to death and destruction. Um, you know, the stupidity of the advice wasn't even original. And, um, you know, this guy who just started out with so much promise ended up so badly. Why? Like, what was going on in his heart that made this happen? And I really think it's because he fails to trust that God is good. He fails to trust God's word and his promises. He fails to trust that God's ways and that God's promises are better than his plans. You know, he didn't want to risk doing what's, like, unwise or strategically poor in our world and actually have faith in God. And, you know, as a Christian, we are given God's word. In the Bible. I know that sounds really basic, but it's profoundly true. Yet, it's got so much of the advice we need, the commands we need for life. Yet, rather than turn to the Bible and search for answers there, how often do we turn to society? How often do we turn to the culture around us? You know, we're not helped by the fact that our heart is deceitful and leans away from God. And so we can drift by the noise that's bombarded by us. You know, I think often for us, the heart issue is similar to Jeroboam. You know, whether it's um, insecurity, whether it's fear, or whether it's pride, but we decide not to heed God's word, to follow in God's words. Um, think about, you know, some of the big issues that we uh, confront uh, at the moment and what's actually um, shaping the way you think. You know, um, is it the way, you know, we view sexuality? or the way we look at marriage, or the way we look at singleness, or believing that, um, you know, you're not complete unless you've got a partner. Um, like Mike mentioned last week, you know, we saw in Solomon's life, you know, disobeying God and deciding to date or marry a non-Christian. Or what about the way we look at things like pro-life or pro-choice or euthanasia or so many other things? The question for us is our primary source of influence, the creator of this world, the one who created humans with dignity and um, worth and purpose. You know, the only way to have informed views on these things is actually to know God's Word. But it's not the kind of thing that we need to know God's Word at this time, but we need to be continually in it. Because the ways of God and the ways of the world are often pulling you know, completely apart. And unless we're in God's Word regularly reminding us of His goodness, of His trustworthiness, then we are going to just drift with the world. And the consequences of that can be quite disastrous, right? Like it can um, you know, be that we don't live the life that God made us to live. We fail to see the blessings that he has for us. 
Or, like in the case of Jeroboam, it can even be that we drift right out of the faith altogether. And that can affect not just us, but the generations to come. You know, um, in Rehoboam, a little bit like me, so that was Solomon's son, uh, when I ignored Izzy with the uh, sleep apnea test, uh, you know, we often ignore good advice um, from those around us because we just don't like what they're saying, right? Like, how often are we just inclined to follow and seek out advice of those who tell us what we actually want to hear? You know, so often we do that. Um, you know, Dave was talking about unity before around COVID and vaccine stuff and things like that. You know, how many of us actually seek the people that agree with us as our experts and sort of try to run to that? It's just an example of that. You know, there's a real wisdom, uh, I think, that we saw in the story of Rehoboam of uh, actually listening to the words of older, wiser Christians, right? People who've followed Jesus for a long time, that have lived more life, that have got a bigger picture of things, uh, that have been humbled, you know, by this world, have so much to offer. Um, yeah, we don't offer their, you know, we don't follow their advice blindly, right? Like, it's got to be consistent with Scripture. But I want to encourage uh, younger people in our church, you know, don't ignore the older people. They're a massive blessing to us. Um, try to connect with them, have them in your life. Uh, I know personally, um, you know, Izzy and I have been so blessed by you know, different seasons in our GC. We've had older people in our GC. We've gotten to do life with them, and they have shaped and formed so much of um, the way we look at what life looks like as we get older and what it looks like to follow Jesus at different stages of life. And I want to say to the older people in our church, you know, it's easy to look around a church like this and go, Jesus, a lot of young people, I don't have anything to offer. We need you. Uh, we need you investing in the people, uh, the younger people of our church. And I'm you know, super thankful to say that we've got lots of older people that are so intentional that invest in our younger people, but we need all the more of that. And um, if you sit here and go, hey, I'm just in my 20s, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't have anything to offer anyone, I want to encourage you to consider how you could get involved in our next generation ministries. You know, we've got creche, we've got city kids, we've got youth. Think about how some of your youth leaders affected you and helped form the way you think. And that can be something that you can be involved in. So remember that, you know, our hearts are deceitful and we want to ignore God's word and good advice and run to our society to, to define what's right and wrong. We need to ground ourselves in God's word daily which reminds us that God is good, that he is trustworthy. So the first mistake that we saw Jeroboam make is actually the failure to hear God's words. How are we doing? Good? All right. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. <laughs> um, the next thing we see is his failure to walk in his ways. Um, you see, Jeroboam didn't realize that worshiping God under his own terms is not worshiping God at all. Uh, in chapter 12 we see that Jeroboam makes up his own worship. Uh, he's not throwing God out altogether. He's just tweaking things to suit himself. Uh, so he's made altars. He's defined where worship ought to take place. And he used strategic places that were actually significant in Israel's history. So it didn't seem too random. Um, yeah, he's appointed priests from different people. He's made up his own feasts. Um, and yeah, even after the hand-freezing incident and the warning that he got, uh, it tells us in chapter 13, verse 33, um, after this thing, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but made priests for the high places again from among all the people. Anyone uh, would he ordain to be priests of the high places. And this thing became a sin to the house of Jeroboam, so as to cut it off and to destroy it from the face of the earth. You see, Jeroboam isn't making this false decision, because, uh, sorry, this false religion, because he doesn't know who the real God is. You know, he does know who the real God is. He's experienced the power of his word. He saw his prophecy fulfilled. Like, he's actually king at the moment. And he saw God's power when he, um, uh, when he had his hand frozen. Yet, he creates this because he wants to keep control. He doesn't trust God at his word. He doesn't trust the promises that God made him. He wants to use strategy. He wants to use what he thinks is going to um, help hold his kingdom. And so rather, by live, so rather than living by faith in the one who has proven to be faithful to him, he decides 
to follow in his own ways. So unfortunately for Jeroboam, rather than seeing the fruits that are promised to him from God, if he follows his commands, instead, he actually ends up being the poster boy for sinful kings of Israel. Uh, as you read First and Second Kings, um, and it's describing other sinful kings, it often refers uh, to him in these lines. It says, um, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam in his sin, which made Israel to sin. Jeez, that's not a reputation you want, is it? <laughs> um, and, you know, you think, okay, well, that's just, you know, that's one half, that's Jeroboam. What about Solomon's son? You know, there's still a bit of a hope here, but unfortunately, later on in chapter 14, you read about Rehoboam, and he ain't doing much better. You know, he sets up shrines and, and things like that for false gods. You know, what a devastating state for God's people to be in. Um, you know, both kings decided that walking in God's ways was not worth it, that they wanted to do their own thing. And, you know, it's important to notice the severe consequences for them personally, but also for their people and the generations to come. So when you read these sorts of things, uh, I want us to be able to see the consequences of to failure of us relating to God to the way he wants us to relate to him. Uh, you know, the consequence of us choosing to make up our own rules are severe. Uh, the consequence of the sin of rejecting our creator are sort of devastating. You know, worshipping God under our own terms and putting ourselves as king is not actually worshipping him at all. Um, as I mentioned, we've got four kids. Uh, number three is, uh, is Noah, and Noah is often described uh, by his older brothers as being wild, and he is a little bit wild. He's super cute, uh, but he, he's a little bit wild, and he's desperate to keep up with his brothers. So, you know, the kid taught himself how to read, uh, sorry, um, not read, not yet, um, you know, ride without training wheels at three, you know, he can skateboard, uh, rollerblade, um, you know, he, he climbs whatever they climb. Um, so he, he just has to teach himself because we've got four kids, we don't have time for that. Um, but he's just like, it's like he's trying to kill himself, like he doesn't have a lot of fear. Uh, but when we take Noah for a bike ride, uh, it's weird because we've got a bunch of rules to try to keep him alive, and some of those rules he follows really, really well. Like, he's not a runner. He's not a kid that's going to run off and not come back. He'll sort of always boomerang back. Um, he's really good at stopping when we say stop, uh, and he'll never cross the road. Like, he's really careful of crossing the road, so he'll stop and wait for us, and he'll come back and loop around to us. But there's some rules that he just will not follow. And um, one of those is going down the steep hills. Like, we're like, you've got to slow down, and he just won't have it. And um, a couple of weeks ago, Izzy was going for a run, and he convinced her to take him, and everything had been going well, and they were on their way home, and there's a steep hill coming, and she says, no, you've got to slow down the hill, mate, be careful, and he just guns it. And uh, bottom of the hill, lands head first, misses his helmet, he's got this huge egg on his head, um, and, you know, had to rush him to hospital, and, you know, he, he's fine, there was no concussion. Um, but, you know, afterwards, we're, we're talking to him, we're like, Noah, mate, we've got these rules to try to keep you safe, and you've got to follow all of the rules, not just half of the rules uh, that we give you. Um, but, you know, when I was thinking about Noah, uh, I think that's often a little bit like us with God, right? Like, we want to uh, follow, hey, I'm going to follow some of God's commands, but there's certain things that I, I don't want to follow, um, and sometimes I wonder if we take God's commands as seriously as we ought to. Uh, you know, we're trying to have one foot in God's camp and one foot in the world. Uh, we want the blessing of being his people, but we don't actually want him as our king, right? Uh, we want the benefit of, say, Christian community, but we don't want to love people sacrificially. Or we want to love God, but we still want to hold on and love to our possessions and money. Um, you know, we want to be God's children, but we don't want to have a high view of marriage when things are getting tough. Um, you know, we want to be God's people, but we want to ignore him on sexual ethics where it doesn't suit us. Or maybe we want God's grace without it leading to obedience and good works and so on and so on. And I guess um, what we often want to do is decide the things that we want to follow uh, and then the other things that we just want to ignore. You know, we want to worship God in our own terms and that's not worshiping him at all. And I want to encourage you to think through what that means for you. What parts of your life are you choosing to ignore God on? And that's different for all of us. You know, so if you're still with me, 
uh, you know that we have seen uh, Jeroboam's failure to hear God's word, and now we've looked at his failure to follow in his ways. And both of these failures, I think, is actually caused by a lack of belief that God really is good, that God wants good for him, that God's ways are better than the wisdom of the world. But if you leave today, and what you've gotten out of these few chapters is that, hey, I've got to follow God's word, you know, take good advice, and work really hard to obey God's commands, then you've kind of missed the big thing that's going on in this passage. And so the third thing that I want to look at is Jeroboam's failure to see God's work in history. And I want to encourage you that it is utterly important that we see God's work in history. So imagine you're one of the faithful remnant in Jerusalem, right? Like in this time of Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Um, imagine how hopeless they must feel at the moment, right? They've just lived through the glory times of David and Solomon. And in Israel's history, now that the, the kingdom's split, it's devastating for them. Uh, they've got these two kings that are taking things from bad to worse. And you wouldn't blame them for thinking that God's either lost control or he's not powerful enough to do anything about it. But when you read the passage, this is clearly not the case. Let's pick it up in chapter 11, verse 31. It says, And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I'm about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and will give you ten tribes. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, that the city I have chosen out of, uh, out of all the tribes of Israel. So can you see that it's actually God taking the kingdom away from Solomon under his terms as well. And in chapter 12, uh, verse 15, uh, this is talking about Rehoboam, uh, Solomon's son. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord spoke to Hijah the Shelonite, to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And then we pick it up again in verse 21 of chapter 12. It says, When Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen warriors, to fight against the house of Israel to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God. Say to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, thus says the Lord, you shall not go up or fight against your relatives, the people of Israel. Every man return to his home, for this thing is from me. So you can see here, even in, in the evil and the brokenness, God is working his will. He's still in control and he's still sovereign over all things. Now, you might say, whoa, 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 well, I've been listening to you for 28 minutes at the moment and you've been going on about the importance of listening to God's word, about us taking good advice, about us obeying God's command. But now you're saying God's sovereign over all this thing. Like, can, you really, can we really hold Rehoboam and Jeroboam responsible, right? Um, and that's actually a really great question because this passage of Scripture, like many others, actually present the complexity of what really is going on. Okay, the Bible clearly teaches um, that what humans do matters. Man's responsibility for our actions really, really matters. Um, you know, and we can see the consequences for Jeroboam and Rehoboam. We can even see the consequence of, you know, Adam and Eve's sin initially. So human responsibility for sin and our actions is real. But then the Bible also teaches that God is completely sovereign, that God works his way, weaves his way through history to work his good purposes. And so both uh, are true, God's, a man's responsibility and God's sovereignty, and both feel like they're in tension with each other, but they're both completely true. And failing to see God's sovereignty in all things um, is, is a really big omission. So, what hope do these people that are in Jerusalem, these faithful remnant, what hope do they have? It's the hope that God is sovereign, that He does keep His word. Uh, they know that He has kept His word in the past, and they can trust for him to keep his word in the future. So not all hope is lost because God is in the business of restoring broken people and the broken world to himself. Um, 
they have his promise way back in Genesis. I know Mike referred to this, where the, um, you know, the offspring of the woman will, um, you know, his heel shall, um, shall crush the serpent. Uh, and then you fast forward to Genesis 12, God makes a covenant with Abraham saying, you know, through your family, I'm going to bless every nation of this world. And then we see in Exodus, um, God working again through the, um, the Passover, the blood of the lamb, the doorpost, God's people, um, their judgment being passed over. And then we see so many signs in the laws and the sacrifices. And then in history, we pick it up again in 2 Samuel 7. I know Mike hit this last week and we'll probably hit this every week in this series because it's such a key passage. Um, and God is promising David regarding his son, Solomon, in verse 12, it says, I will establish his kingdom and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, if you read this passage and haven't read 1 Kings carefully, you might be thinking that God has gone back on his promise. You know, he's taken the kingdom away from David's line. But we can see that that's not the case. You can see the hint there, even in the prophecy of Jeroboam initially, it says, yet to his son, that's David, you know, um, Solomon's son, I will give one tribe that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem the city where I've chosen to put my name. You know, so even though God's about to take the kingdom from David's house because of Solomon's sin, can you see that God is still being faithful to his promise here? That he's still true to his word, that David's line will continue. Now, this is a massive word of encouragement to us, God's sovereignty, that is. That when we're looking at life and we're scratching our head and wondering what the heck is going on, you know, when things feel like they're out of control, um, God's sovereignty is the thing that gives you hope when life feels completely hopeless. It is the solid thing that you can lean on. So no matter what you're going through at the moment, remember this amazing truth. Remember that He is sovereign, He is in control, and He's trustworthy because of what He has done. You know, this even shows hope in the time of kingdom divide, right? Like, how tragic is it, these brothers fighting with each other in Israel and splitting, you know, the, the people uh, being split like this. And, you know, things have gone down pretty, um, pretty quickly. Uh, you know, both kingdoms are going to end up being exiled, and it all seems so, so bad. Uh, I know a bunch of people in our church have been uh, podcasting uh, the rise and fall of Mars Hill, um, it's a tragic story of the collapse of a big church uh, nearly overnight. Uh, and it's really easy to listen to what went on there and, um, and reflect, uh, and maybe even um, reflect on your own hurt with churches, right? Um, and maybe um, church splits that you've been through. And, um, and it's easy to walk out of that feeling hopeless, uh, feeling really skeptical and um, a little bit uh, bitter of churches and church leaders. Um, and sometimes, rightfully so, right? Uh, but despite broken churches and despite broken leaders, uh, none of that's going to prevent God uh, bringing his kingdom in power and in glory. And uh, one commentator describes it as this. He says, um, these church you know, splits, these kingdom divisions, tarnish its luster by our folly and faithfulness, but God's will will be done. And this is good news even in the hardest time. And I guess we get to choose whether uh, we uh, contribute to that tarnish <laughs> in our folly and faithlessness. But, um, you know, these faithful few, uh, their hope wasn't in vain. You know, we actually live a little bit further on in history, right? And so we get to see the story play out all the more. And so we have even more reason to understand why seeing God's work in history is so important. Um, in, uh, in the book of Hosea, just before Judah is about to go to exile, uh, God says this to Hosea in chapter 3, verse 5. It says, Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the later days. So even before they get taken out, God's promising that he, they will come back. 
And then while they're in exile, God reinforces his promise to David's line. Um, And in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 23, it says, And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them, he shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, and I have spoken. And then you fast forward to Jesus who is of the line of David. And in John chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his teeth, for his teeth, for his sheep. (laughs) I feel like I'm at work here. (laughs) Teeth are important. Don't lay down your life for them. Sheep, sheep. Um, You know, I used to to work in a shoe store while I was at dental school, and I used to get shoes and teeth mixed up all the time when you're in clinic or at the store. Uh, that was terrible. Sorry. We will use the 8.30 for the podcast, Dave. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, but he also looks after his teeth. Uh, so anyway, um, we see all of God's promises to David actually fulfilled in Jesus, right? Um, and it's when things look desperately lost, you know, as Jesus hangs on that tree, as he's crucified, as the religious leaders have plotted against him, as one of his close followers has sold him out, as he's just been tortured and he's dying on that cross, you can imagine his followers feeling a lot like the Israelites in the time of Jeroboam Rehoboam, right? Going, what the heck is going on here? Everything has gone so wrong. Where is God? And, you know... On that third day, as Jesus rose again from the dead, we see that despite man plotting for evil, God uses that for good. Because it's in that moment that it looked like God lost control as Jesus hung on that tree. Jesus, who is the one that lived that righteous life that Jeroboam was called to live, he's the one that has always listened to God's word. He's always walked in God's ways, and he knows what God is doing in history at that moment. At that point where God looked like he lost control was actually the moment of greatest victory, right? As Jesus paid the price for our sins. Uh, In Romans chapter 3, it explains uh, what went on here so well. It says in verse 22, The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. You know, the righteousness that Jeroboam fell short of, um, the righteousness that even David fell short of, is the same righteousness that you and I fall short of. But that righteousness can be given to us by faith in Jesus, if you put your trust in Him. If you realize that you fall terribly short because of your sin, but by grace, the free gift of God, that Jesus took that punishment for your sin, and instead of that punishment, we get His righteousness um, in the eyes of God. And that is what we call the great exchange, and that is amazing news. But you know, it's when we see God's work in history of Jesus on that cross, that then we can clearly see this world and life as it is. And it's at that point that then we want to heed God's word. We want to listen to God's word. We want to know what he has for us because we trust that he is good, he is faithful, and he is worth following. And that is when uh, we naturally should turn our heart and want to walk in God's ways. Uh, We want to take obedience seriously because we see what God has done in history. And because God has fulfilled what he said he was going to do in Jesus... Uh, we trust that God will fulfill what he says he's going to do, and that is in returning and bringing us to him. So um, why don't we pray? Um, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you um, speak to us in your word. I thank you that you've given this passage, uh, that we may be able to see uh, the mistakes of the kings of, uh, of Israel, Lord, that we might be able to learn from that. Father, I pray that you give us eyes to see your work in history, to see your sovereign power, Give us eyes to see that you are good, that you are worth trusting, Lord. uh, Lord, I pray that you give us the urge to hear your word and to follow in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen.